Dave Grohl, the death metal musician? Yes, it really happened, and it was awesome. Today, we're going to talk about Dave Grohl's often forgotten side project where he released a death metal album in collaboration with a ton of awesome different musicians, and it was completely amazing. Dave has been in numerous different bands from obviously Nirvana and the Foo Fighters and then a ton of different side projects, but he's always had this underlying affinity for heavy metal, including that infamous time that he reportedly performed with the band Ghost, where it's been highly rumored that Dave Grohl has gotten up on stage with Ghost and performed as one of the nameless ghouls. But obviously they won't confirm what show this took place at, but What's more, a lot of people don't realize that Dave Grohl has also outright produced Ghost. So he's been linked to the metal world for quite some time, and obviously Dave Grohl is inherently metal. But this is the first time that I could trace where he was directly metal, and he loved metal so much that he wanted to release his own death metal project that has gone very much by the wayside, but is certainly worth your time and still holds up today. Talking about Grohl's long history with Ghost, if you don't remember, back in 2013, Ghost released their first EP called If You Have Ghost, and Dave Grohl actually produced that himself. He's very closely linked with that band, but obviously this EP took place long before even that Dave Grohl released this album. It's called Probot. That was the side project name, and it was sort of released with very little fanfare. He didn't promote it too much. And this is something that very little people talk about, so I wanted to give this album the shine that it very much deserves. Dave, we've been hearing about this for quite some time now. Explain how it all came together. What took so long? Well, um, it started in January of 2000, um, where I just went into my basement and recorded a bunch of riff instrumentals with no intention of singing on it or I didn't really imagine it being a record I was just doinking around in my studio recording riffs okay and uh, I grew up listening to hardcore in the early 80s like 82 and 83 I discovered hardcore and then fell in love with that and then that kind of went hand in hand with a lot of the underground metal at the time and I loved listening to bands like Bad Brains and uh, MDC, but at the same time, I love listening to Slayer and Venom and Merciful Fate and stuff like that. So the concept of this death metal project for Dave Grohl called Probot actually came to fruition when Dave was on tour with the Foo Fighters supporting their album, There Is Nothing Left to Lose, in the early 2000s. And they were playing a lot of softer material, which made Dave yearn for the heavy metal that he grew up jamming to in his Alexandria, Virginia home. So after the tour was complete, Grohl actually linked up with Adam Casper, the producer of There Is Nothing Left To Lose, and they went to his home in Alexandria, Virginia at the time, and they were just chilling watching TV with Dave jamming metal riffs all day. And they were recording in this home studio that he had at the time, and they were putting this together in just about four days relentlessly recording nonstop and doing it basically never expecting it to be released. They were doing this just for fun. Casper would hang out watching TV while Grohl was down in the basement recording and then he would come upstairs and get Casper when he had something he liked and then together they would figure out a drum arrangement and bass. And they did this essentially as a passion project. Grohl said back then that he had no intention of making an album out of the songs. Again, this was merely for fun. He said at the time, I didn't even call them songs because they were bare instrumentals with no intention of putting vocals on them and no direction as an actual song. This went on for four days and then finally, they had a whopping seven tracks that were complete and then Grohl made some copies out of these songs and then labeled it as Probot because he didn't want anybody else mistaking this for potential future material for the Foo Fighters albums. Grohl then decided that he wanted to give life to the project, which he didn't initially intend to make it into something, but he wanted to come up with a collab album with some of his favorite musicians from the underground metal scene when he was growing up. So he had a friend of his help him reach out to these musicians while he was off on the road touring. And he said at the time that he feared having a reputation as a quote, stupid middle of the road alternative rock idiot would hinder his chances of getting these musicians to work with him at the time back in those days. But a ton of them agreed almost immediately and so he knew that he was on the right path. Together, Dave Grohl, producer Adam Casper, and his friend Matt Sweeney all reconvened at his home to do five more instrumental tracks 
to make this album come out to be more of a reality. There were a ton of amazing collabs on this project like Lemmy from Motorhead, Max Cavalera of Sepultura at the time, Tom G. Warrior from Celtic Frost, the almighty King Diamond, and so many others. Now what's interesting is at the time Dave Grohl was also working on another album, but it wasn't his album. He was helping to write for Ozzy Osbourne's solo record Down to Earth back then, and he sent a couple songs over to his people, uh, submitting them to be on that project, and he actually never heard back. So he just repurposed those songs for Probot, and those songs uh, were the ones that feature Eric Wagner and King Diamond. They were originally intended to be written for Ozzy Osbourne. Another thing about the album that was interesting is that Dave Grohl went to great lengths to separate his identity from the album. He didn't want it to be known as the Dave Grohl solo metal band, so it was billed as Probot exclusively and he didn't particularly go around, which is why you don't hear a lot about this project, because Dave Grohl at the time didn't throw his name out a lot to promote this project. He wanted it to have that sort of an underground feel. He told Entertainment Weekly in an interview at the time, not only does this guy do this and this and this and this, but he's got a heavy metal side project as well. The whole thing started in 2000 as an experiment in my basement. It was never supposed to be an album. And as I was writing a lot of these riffs, I didn't even call them songs because they were bare instrumentals with no intention of putting vocals on them and no direction as an actual song. Then after recording seven or eight of the instrumentals, not knowing what to do with them and deciding, fantasizing about my favorite vocalist singing over them, it started to come together and happened, and three years later, the album was pretty much finished, and I had to seriously consider what to do as far as releasing. Grohl told MTV at the time in an interview about Probot that this album came to fruition because he was terribly bored with Foo Fighters, particularly, if you can believe this, one of the band's biggest hits ever, and a song that I and probably many of you personally love a lot, he was talking about Learn to Fly with total contempt at the time, and he called it, quote, the most middle of the road piece of shit I've ever written in my life. This is again after There Is Nothing Left To Lose came out. He said, I thought it's so boring and I can't believe it's the first single and it doesn't represent the rest of the record. So I was just kind of itching to record something that I was really excited about. I love the Foo Fighters record, but there's a lot more of me that's always sort of been this metalhead kid. Grohl spoke to Guitar World at the time on the origin of the project, he said, well, the whole thing started in February of 2000. The Foo Fighters had made our third album, There's Nothing Left to Lose, in 1999, which was a pretty mellow record for us. It was about exploring low-level dynamics and melody and simple arrangements and acoustic guitars. It was more about those things than about hitting the turbo rat and turning it up to 10. So we went out and played a lot of these songs live and they were pretty mellow. I would find myself listening to Se Sepultura's Chaos AD before going on stage and then singing a song like Learn to Fly, which I thought was kind of funny. Like, what am I doing with my life, man? When I was young, my favorite bands were Bad Brains, Void, Minor Threat, MDC, DRI, Corrosion of Conformity, Slayer, Trouble, the Void, uh, Venom, The Obsessed and Merciful Fate. And here I am playing music that sounds like the Eagles or something. I love the Foo Fighters music and I love that album, but at the same time, I never lost that love of heavy music. So I went to my home studio after being on tour and I'm like, man, I've got to record some riffs. I've got to get in there and do something heavy. As, I, as much as I love this acoustic guitar shit, I've just got to feel it in my bones again. I called my friend, Adam Casper, and asked him to come down for three or four days. And I went to the basement and just started recording riffs with no intention of making an album. I couldn't even imagine singing over them. I knew they weren't Foo Fighters songs because they were way too heavy. And at the time, I just wasn't sure where our heads were at. I would sit on the couch drinking beers and watching TV with the Explorer and a little PV practice amp next to me, just playing around. If I came up with something that sparked my interest, I'd say to Adam, come on, let's go downstairs. I'd sit down at the drums and go through a quick arrangement off the top of my head. I didn't adhere to any son of conventional song structure. I just thought, well, maybe that's a verse, maybe that's a chorus. I don't care, let's just record it. And then I'd get out of there and I'd put some bass riffs on it, put some guitar stuff on it. 45 minutes later, you've got a track. I didn't really take it that seriously. So then I'd go back upstairs, grab a couple more beers, come up with another riff, go downstairs and do it again. And within three days, I had seven songs that were basically just riff instrumentals with no suggestion of melody or vocals or anything. Made a copy for a friend, made a copy for another friend, wrote Probot on the reel and just put it on the shelf. Grohl 
recorded a song called Shake Your Blood with Lemmy, and that was the song that got the most hype off of this album. It was a really great song, and personally, I think that all the songs were great, but this one really stood out and was released with a single. They did a music video for it, but it was not the song that Grohl intended to give to Lemmy. He said, I had another song that I was going to give to Lemmy, but the more I listened to it, the more I realized it's important to give each person a song that's within his realm. I'm not gonna give Lemmy a song that sounds like Enya, something that he's gonna fucking shit on and send back. Plus I wanna be the drummer in Motorhead one day, you know? So I wrote a track that's a simple rock song, straight to the point, no filler or fluff, just some things that sound like Lemmy should be singing on it. And he went in, did two vocal takes and he was done. Couple bass tracks, done. He finished up and said, all right, who wants to go look at some tits? I swear to God, man, it was one of the greatest days of my life. That is, I haven't ever read that before. That's amazing. Um, he says, I think everyone was pretty much on board from the beginning. It was mostly a matter of letting them hear the track because I think some of them were sort of suspicious as I'd imagine they would be. Hmm, Dave Grohl, underground metal? I'd better hear this first. Then they heard the track and understood that it was the real deal and that I truly had a love and passion for the music. The album was a great record, but for Grohl, it obviously didn't meet up to his expectations as he told one fan on a tour of his studio that he clearly printed way too many copies of this ProBot record. And I'd love to know if there are still a shit ton of those sitting around at the Foo Fighters studio because I would love to have a copy. Hey, did you ever hear about that ProBot record I of made? Of course, yeah. There's 100,000 of them right there. You want one? I would love one. Cool. I'll give you a box. Uh, wait, yeah. I'll with you. Every I'll give you three boxes. Every box. I'll give you three like boxes. Really? Here, why don't you just take them right I now. could trade this for instant popularity. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Or you could just sell them for money. So that's the story of ProBot. There's an entire Dave Grohl death metal album out there in the stratosphere, and it's a really good record. If you haven't yet in the streaming world, give this record some of your time. It's a very cool record, and it deserves a second look. You should definitely check it out. It's on all streaming services, but people just don't really know that it's out there. Your, your hardcore fan knows that it's out there, but the public at large doesn't know, and I think it's worth checking out if you're into death metal, if you're into the heavy stuff. Hearing Dave Grohl's take on it as a true fan, I think you'd really appreciate it. So anyways, that's all for now. If you're new here at Rockfeed, you can subscribe and ring that notification bell. We're also available in podcast form too. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you all very soon.